everyone, and welcome to Meet an Eco Hero series. And we're thrilled at One Green Thing to introduce you to Julia Cohen, who is an eco hero and a board member of OneGreenThing.org. She's also profiled in my book, One Green Thing Discover Your Hidden Power to Help Save the Planet. Julia is the managing director of the Plastic Pollution Coalition and a dear friend. And I'm so excited to introduce you to her. Her service superpower is the influencer. So if you haven't taken the service superpower assessment, please take it. It's available right on onegreenthing.org and learn more about your strengths and service. And with that, I'm just going to kick it over to Julia. And Julia, if you could please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how you got involved in this work. Well, thank you, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be your friend and board member. Um, I'm a big fan and I love your book and I love the assessment. And I think it's just so brilliant how you came to, you know, write that and create it in order to help people figure out what their one green thing is. Um, you know, I've taken the test now a couple of times and depending on how I deliberately answer it, I can, I have a few superpowers, but being a, you know, a, an influencer and a connector and a philanthropist and, and all those things, I think really come together and are part of like how I got involved in all this in the first place in a way. It's part of my Genesis story. Um, I grew up in the shadow of the entertainment industry in Los Angeles and also at the intersection of kind of nonprofits and social service with my mother running the Los Angeles Free Clinic after having been a social worker, but also after having worked on films with my father who is still going at 92, a documentary filmmaker. and. Um, you know, that's a really interesting combination of things. And it's so amazing to see now almost 55 years later, how it's come full circle in my life. Um, we started the Plastic Pollution Coalition almost 15 years ago. And one of our big projects that we have been doing for a few years now officially, but have always been doing since the beginning is called Flip the Script on Plastics in Film and Television. Um, and, you know, my, my personal journey involved you know, going to graduate school in public health. I mean, earlier in my life, losing my mom to, to breast cancer that was endocrine related um, and learning a lot about public health and then going to graduate school in public health and focusing on maternal and child health, which led me to Washington DC and working in the State Department of all places um, in the Bill Clinton administration doing international family planning and reproductive health policy. And fast forward with many different jobs working for Rock the Vote and in youth civic engagement and running the Youth Vote Coalition and working in many coalitions, having my artist sister, you know, get obsessed with wanting to clean up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, the floating gyre of swirling plastic pollution um, in the whole water column uh, that is now, there are, you know, known patches like this and all the gyres on the planet with her becoming really aware of and, and wanting to do something, getting, you know, pulled in as I've always pulled her into everything I've done my whole life. We've done so many things together um, to create this coalition that we started with about 25 groups and a couple businesses. And we now have almost 1400 businesses and NGOs from 75 countries around the world. And we're about neck and neck businesses and nonprofits now. So we're really focused on educating, connecting and advocating for a, a more just, equitable, regenerative world free of plastic pollution. And we, we do that through our projects and uplifting our coalition members and connecting them to each other and promoting the solutions that they have for a system shift because we don't have time. We are running out of time, Julia. And your journey is so interesting from Rock the Vote and youth engagement and, you know, now to collaborating with your sister, it doesn't get more personal than that, you know, her passion and you being able to bring all of your skills and talents to kind of bring that to scale. And you mentioned the flip the script on plastics and that initiative. Can you talk to us a little bit more about some of the other projects that PPC, the Plastic Pollution Coalition is working on and how people can get involved? Sure. So, you know, flip the script is very much an educational um, initiative. Um, and then we also have the filter not bottled campaign, which is very much focused on the lead pipe replacement in the United States to start and the infrastructure money that is flowing to states through the Environmental Protection Agency to fund the you know, replacement of all of the lead pipes that we don't even know 
how many lead pipes we have in this country. We know we have a lot. We don't even have a full inventory, but we already know that it's going to take billions of dollars. Um, and our tax dollars are have been allocated to help do that with a priority on frontline fence line areas where they're most greatly impacted and um, reservations, indigenous communities, et cetera. Um, but you know, this is gonna take decades. And in the meantime, what are people doing to have lead free and also, you know, forever chemical free, you know, healthier, cleaner water? So we launched a campaign called Filter Not Bottled to focus on making sure that people, you know, aren't given single use plastic bottled water unless there's no alternative um, with that tax, those tax dollars and also that those lead pipes are not replaced with plastic. Um, and, you know, that better materials are used because part of why we have a lead pipe replacement, a lead pipe problem in this country was, an, an, you know, an inherently racist in the first place with the great migration north and there's a great Washington Post article about that. Um, and then in addition to kind of that, which involves also a lot of advocacy and outreach to not only federal um, agencies like the EPA or even the White House and Capitol Hill, but also state level and, you know, and city governments and getting and supporting communities to also um, have the tools to put that pressure to make sure that they that our own tax dollars are used to our benefit in a healthy way. Um, we also have created something we're calling the Global Plastic Laws Database um, that will be launching in the next couple months, mostly in the fall. And it's a, the next version of what is currently on our website is the Global Plastic um, Reduction Toolkit, Legal Law Reduction Toolkit, something like that. It's very well, too long. So now it's gonna be shorter, but we're amassing um, and putting in a database all of the laws from across the planet related to um, plastic pollution. Um, so that's a really big one. I'm sure I'm forgetting some others. We do a lot of work to just connect our coalition members. We just recently launched in partnership with one of our coalition members, um, Oceanic Global, something um, called the Blue Verification. And it just has been, um, just come out. And so if you have a business um, or a product company, et cetera, you can seek to get uh, Blue Verify and there's, different levels that includes plastic free verification. So super exciting stuff. Well, it is very exciting. And there's so many opportunities for people to get involved and to, you know, I talk a lot about service as one green thing, but to to have service to others by by supporting PPC, by getting involved with PPC. And I just love all the things that you're doing. And one of the things you talk about is, you know, with this database of laws, with the work that you're doing with lead pipes, mm -hmm is there's a lag time. There's a lag time with the policy mm -hmm. and the need for change. And a lot of times that drives what I've done a lot of research on, as you know, is eco-anxiety. And so we're just going to ask you a little bit about like how you deal with eco-anxiety, how you deal with that lag. And then maybe if you could also say kind of what your favorite one green thing is as a way to try to deal with that, that frustration. Sure. And, um, I think that I'm, I'm glad that it's been recognized as a thing finally, because you know part of what has driven our work for a while was this like, like growing recognition of this like planetary crisis. And you know, I have a daughter, I have a family, I, you know, I have loved ones I, I care about myself. Um, you know, we're, we're experiencing this incredible heat waves everywhere and floods and and everything and it's just it's overwhelming um in so many ways and yet i think the taking action in the ways that you you know based on your assessment can do and feel empowered through that and make a difference you know people think that we are such a bigger organization than we are um and i think we have 14 full-time people now which is the biggest we've ever been which is amazing um <laughs> but but you know you know a few determined people can really change things and having the support and working in collaboration and planting seeds and working with amazing young people and scientific advisors and notables um everybody can do something and even if it's just the you know changes in your own daily life, which we have all kinds of tips and tools and, and guides on how to do that. And then we have information about how to like change your local community and influence government. 
you know, so it's a journey. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one that when I feel freaked out about stuff, I think one of the things that really is my one green thing is water and getting my blue mind on one of our founding um, notable coalition members and advisors is Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, goes by Jay. He wrote a book called Blue Mind. And he talks about blue mind, gray mind, red mind, and that, you know, we are made of water. We need to think about water, be in water, visualize water, drink water um, in order to be balanced and calm and, and empowered in a way too. And so um, he now does incredible, he does therapy sessions about getting your blue mind on with, with sports teams and you know, folks in the military and, and the people and the groups working with him are seeing incredible improvement in their performance. Like those teams are winning, right? And so I think for me, it's it's being near water, seeing water, being in water is really my, my, my thing to personally do or, you know, make happen um, physically. And then you know, as an action or activity, I mean, you know, I, it, I have to pull myself away from doing a lot of work all the time. It's self-care. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, and, but I do, I love what I do. And um, I'm, I'm just so grateful that I, you know, that I can actually support myself and my family while doing Absolutely. stuff to, to help with this issue. So. Absolutely. And that is such a joy and it's an honor to be able to do this work, even though to your point, it can be exhausting. I love the, the blue mind concept and, you know, recognizing biophilia, you know, we're hardwired to connect to nature, that water is part of who we are and being grounded in that work. And you kind of like the next question I have is kind, you kind of already addressed, but I'd love to just kind of really focus in on it because I think it's important, especially when people are focusing on the headlines uh, right now, which are very, very scary. And that is, you know, what gives you hope? You've been doing this work for such a long time. The coalition is growing, but I would love to get your thoughts on what gives you hope. And then I have one more final question for you. Sure. Well, I think you know, a lot of people say, oh, the young people, the next generation kind of thing. And I have worked, you know, I, I was vice president of Rock the Vote. I ran the Youth Vote Coalition in the 2000 elections. Um, I've worked with young people. I used to be a young person. <laughs> Me too. I was a young person I, too. I, I, I gave birth to one. Um, and, you know, they don't want all this dumped on their shoulders. Um, I know, and I love, you know, you talk often about, you know, like standing on the shoulders of, of your elders, but also that as an elder, like, you know, what role do you have to play and sharing our wisdom and, you know, we can do more and we need to do more. And so, you know, we have a, an amazing group of youth ambassadors and are developing programs and projects with them and uplifting and supporting you know, you know, their work, but also providing that wisdom and that guidance and, you know, things that can really, I mean, I, you know, it gives me hope to work with them and also help them do better while we do better together. Um, so I think intergenerational um, action on this issue. And I mean, this intersectional issue that affects everything and, and all of us is what gives me hope. That's beautifully said that, that we can help them do better while we do better. And I think that's, that's really important is recognizing that it's a, a two way uh, street, you know, it's, it's, and it actually yeah. if you've got the baby boomers, you know, it's three, you know, three way, like all of <laughs> us together, generation through generation. Um, what I was also going to ask you next is, you know, there are a lot of people who are now connecting the dots between what they're experiencing with these extreme weather events and climate, and they want to get involved. What is your advice to folks who are new to climate action that want to get involved? What advice do you have to them? Well, I think doing the assessment is such a great way to, to figure out how you can comfortably take more action or be involved. Um, that it, it, you know, I, I can't promote it enough. I think everyone needs to, to do it to really help figure out the ways that you can best grow in your journey. Um, because otherwise it is overwhelming. You can't be the one to do everything. And we all need to figure out what we do best or what brings us joy in doing it and then 
also helps counter our own eco anxiety at the same time. And so, you know, small steps and daily steps, um, you know, there's lots of stuff to do in your personal life. And, but there's lots of people who also feel overwhelmed by that and like, oh, is that really going to make a difference? Well, it, it does actually like the, the, you know, switching to a reusable bottle, bag, refusing straws, those things like are very tangible. And there's calculations on how many other, you know, plastic, you know, bottles that, you know, that, that deters from being used, created, landfilled, et cetera. And understanding that like, it's not just in your daily life that that affects, but that like plastic pollutes from every stage of existence. It's the, you know, 99% of it's made from fossil fuels and, and you know, gas. So it, from extraction to processing, to use, to disposal, it is, you know, polluting people and the planet and, you know, the people who live closest to all of those things the most. Um, and so it's super important to see the big picture, but then also recognize where you fit in and what you're most comfortable with. So we have tons of tools and resources. And I know there's not only your assessment, but there's lots out there where you can find out how to, you know, take some action or do something. Absolutely. Well, Julia, thank you so much for your time, for your work, for your commitment, for your courage. Um, I'll make sure all the social media handles for Plastic Pollution Coalition are in the uh, YouTube description. So check out the captions, but please follow Julia. Please follow Plastic Pollution Coalition. They have all kinds of fabulous webinars, all kinds of wonderful resources. I'm so grateful for your leadership and for who you are. Thank you for spending this time with us today. Thanks, Julia. Thank you so much. Great to be here.